Newsmaker Sunday with Fox 10's John Hook. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Sunday. It is great to have an old friend back, John Shattuck, who was a representative brought in during the Republican Revolution in 1994, served in Congress until uh, 2011. Remember of the Republican Party, of course, and um, really rose up through the ranks and became a very powerful member of the House of Representatives, and now is um, back practicing law, right? Absolutely. Enjoying being in Arizona all the time. It's good to see you again. And yeah. we'll talk about the politics of the day. There's a lot to talk about. Certainly needed. And this is the biggest employer up there? Oh, yeah. In northern Arizona, it's beyond almost a yeah. thousand people, right? Yes. You've got the power plant, and then you have the Cayenta mine, the coal mine, which fuels it. It's a coal fired plant. The coal has been the issue, right? That it's a coal fired plant, it draws the ire of environmentalists. And even SRP saying we can do it more cheaply with natural gas than doing coal. Coal draws the fire, but it's a little bit of an unfair argument. Um, coal was proposed as an alternative to hydropower because the environmental movement did not want any more dams built on the Colorado River. Right. And it was ex actually the executive director of the Sierra Club who in testimony before Congress said, well, we don't object to you having the water, and we don't ha object to you moving it off the Colorado and up into Phoenix and on to Tucson, but we just don't want you to use another dam on the Colorado. Right. Right. So a decision was made, and he suggested coal or nuclear power. Might have been ahead of his time on nuclear power, but coal was what the Secretary of Interior finally decided and what was built. And now there's a dispute about whether coal, in fact, is more expensive and will remain more expensive. Some people argue that natural gas has dipped in price, but that that's only a temporary dip in price and that it won't continue. Indeed, there are buyers, potential buyers looking to try to buy the plant, who could believe they can produce electricity out of the plant at a much lower cost than it has been in the recent past. For the Hopi and the Navajo, this is where the economic argument gets in for jobs. I think unemployment on the reservations is 60 percent. For them, it's 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 it's, it's lifestyle and it's economic necessity. Uh, it is the lifeblood for the Hopi tribe. It is a critical component for the Navajo tribe. And they were told, interestingly, by the then Secretary of State, Stuart, or Secretary of Interior, Stuart Udall, yeah. that this plant would be there for 70 years. I've been to a couple of CAP board meetings where Hopi leader after Hopi leader, Navajo leader after Navajo leader say, when you built this, you told us that it would provide jobs and royalties mm -hmm. from the mine and from the plant and taxes, tax revenue for 70 years. That and now, was promised in the 60s? Now, now yes, in the 60s. 1968 was the year it was okay. lobbied into Under place Lyndon by Johnson. Carl Hayden and signed into law by Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon and Johnson. With the Udalls involved and John Rhodes and a lot of old-time Arizonans. So when people argue, hey, if it can be done for cheaper, maybe you just got to phase it out. If that were true, then yes, it would be. And that would be SRP's out. call, right? There, well, it wouldn't be SRP's call. The law that was written vested all the authority with the Secretary of Interior. The federal government actually built a larger power plant that it retained control of, or that it retained as its own, than one needed to generate the power required for the pumps. You would think that if Arizona said, come build us a plant to generate enough power for the pumps, that's what they'd do. But instead, they said, look, uh, we want you, the state of Arizona, now the Central Arizona Water Conservation District, to repay us. So we'll build a plant bigger than is needed for the Some pumps. Some of that power goes to Vegas. And you sell the excess. Right. And Vegas, the, Tucson, Phoenix, right? And the law says that the excess must be sold by the Secretary of Interior. He has to maximize it. He has to talk to people in Arizona before he sells it. He has to consult with the Secretary of Energy before he sells it. But then he must sell it and maximize the revenue to repay the debt. So you're representing the folks who want to keep it open? Representing the people who think we ought to pay that debt and that we made a promise. You mm -hmm. know, I grew up believing if you make an agreement, you know, John, uh, you've got a lot of money and I need a power plant in the canal, um, I'll agree to repay you for the power plant and the canal. Mm -hmm. If you'll put the money up front, you ought to live up to your word. And, and, and it's not just our <laughs> word. Right. It's not just our, our word to the federal government. It's our word to the Navajo people and the Hopi people. Uh, and, you know, if it's on economic, fine. Then go back to Congress and change the law. Don't just walk away. And if you think about it, Phoenix is gorgeous, and it's grown like crazy, and it's green, unlike lots of other places in the southwest that are brown. 
because we've had the benefit of the electricity right. generated by that power plant. Now, suddenly, because we think it's more convenient to use uh, more politically correct power, maybe renewable energy, or maybe natural gas, if it stays cheap, uh, and just walk away mm -hmm. from the Native Americans who agreed to have the mine dug on their land and to have the power plant situated on their land. Um, I, th I think we need to slow down here uh, and, and decide if that's the right thing to do. But I think we we'll also need to slow down and see if it's the economic thing do to you, do. When do you think a decision will be coming? Well, uh, when do you think we'll figure this out? The proponents of getting rid of Navajo want it all to happen yesterday. They've been pushing for this as fast as they can. Is it an they environmental want, push primarily or an economic push? They're claiming it's an economic push because the price of natural gas dipped. Right. Of course, I would argue the reason the price of natural gas dipped is because we're doing fracking now. And so we've increased the supply, and that makes it less expensive because the demand stayed the same. However, we're about to start exporting natural gas through LNG terminals. When that happens, uh, the studies which the supporters of the plant have say that coal will become more economical and that as early as 2020, um, it'll be producing electricity significantly cheaper than natural gas. So you're saying slow it down gas. and see what happens. Look, if, if you have a huge asset and it loses money for a month or for one year, and that's all that's happened here, you don't shut it within minutes. Let's talk about for a minute, you just brought it up. It's a perfect segue. Perfect. Living up to your agreements. Can you roll tape number seven, please? Iran. Ah. Now, you were in Congress for a long time. Yes. Congress never signed off on the Iran nuclear deal. This was an Obama administration deal, right? Right. So therefore, it is not a treaty. It correct? is not a treaty. No doubt about it. Absolutely no doubt about it. It's not a treaty. And a so, group of senators, including Tom Cotton and others, wrote to the Iranians when the deal was signed and said, be advised, our Constitution requires that if this is to be a treaty and therefore binding on the American government, mm -hmm. it must be ratified by the United States Senate. Thomas Jefferson wrote about this. It was never submitted. Thing. It was never submitted for ratification. He said, if you're not getting the Senate to sign on to this, uh, it is not a treaty. For those attacking Trump and saying that America has gone back on its word, that's simply not the case. Because this was a deal struck by one administration which chose not to submit it to Congress for ratification as a treaty. This strikes me that we are in a time politically. A long where, ways from Navajo generating states. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> but it's interesting about talking about deals. We are in a politics right now, and you were there through all kinds of different regimes, where you're going to have presidents, I suspect, come in and do executive orders, and then the next guy comes in, or woman, and undo them. This is kind of the same thing. Obama makes a deal with Iran. Trump comes in and says, I don't like it. We're undoing it. It is exactly where we are. Uh, and we may be close to the pinnacle of where presidents try to get away with things that are beyond their powers. For many years, Congress gave power away to the executive branch, to the president, because they didn't want to be held accountable. Now they're seeing what happens when it comes home to roost and when uh, presidents decide, well, great, I'll, I'll just ignore the Congress. Remember the famous words, I have a pen and a phone. <laughs> what do I need and a Congress so does Trump. For? So does right. Trump. Now that you've been out of it, I mean, you were in it for 17 years? 16 years. Eight 16 terms. years. How do you view what is happening in Washington? Is it really much different than the, the acrimony that went on during the Clinton impeachment, for instance? We've, we've been pretty divided for a while. Um, in many ways, it's not a lot different in the sense that there were pitched partisan divides when I was there. We went in as the Republican Revolution, and we disagreed with the Clinton agenda. Arguably, we got the majority because the American people didn't want uh, Hillary care, and so it was pretty intense. What I would say is different is the intensity of the animosity for Trump, I would can say as a person, but also as president. Um, the media is unanimously committed to destroying him, whatever the cost. And the people who hate him uh, characterize themselves as the resistance. Do you know? We were, have never, you met the, we were never the resistance. We, we, we were the loyal opposition, even when it was a Republican Congress led by Newt Gingrich, 
versus Bill Clinton. If the Democrats were to, you know, they talk about this blue wave, we'll see. Um, if, if the Democrats get power in the House, would you bet on articles being dr drafted to impeach Donald Trump? And then, uh, you know, the, the votes don't appear to be anywhere close to two-thirds in the U.S. Senate. So that would just seem like an empty gesture. Was it during Clinton as well, where you knew all along the votes wouldn't be there in the Senate? Um, I hope they don't, because I think it would be very bad for the nation for uh, them to seek to impeach uh, another president. Did you think it was bad in, back in the, you know, in, what was it, 97? I, I didn't think it was a particularly prudent course but based on the evidence in front of you in front of me i felt i had to vote for the articles of impeachment mm -hmm. i will say that and maybe this was just naivety on my part um, i i didn't know to a certainty that uh, he would not be found uh, guilty removed, in the senate found guilty in the senate and yeah, removed the trial in the senate right. and I, and i can't so say right you now thought that there i was know, a chance yeah. i can't say right now that i know that won't happen in the Senate if they decide. Have you met Trump? I've never met Donald Trump. What do you think watching this from afar? I mean, there is the, for conservatives, I think there is the bluster that makes some people uncomfortable, the tweeting and all of that. But then I think there are conservatives who are watching the results and they're saying, the results feel very Reagan-esque to me. They don't feel crazy or an outlier compared to what any other Republican president would try to accomplish. Am I wrong? No, I think you're spot on. Uh, he has kept more promises. He has accomplished, I mean, if you take the person, Donald Trump, out of the equation and say, let's say the winner was just one of the others. Just look at the results. Just look at the results. Uh, the reduction in regulations that were abusive, the uh, passage of the tax legislation. This is all Republican uh, stuff, the, right? Uh, this is the foreign policy which says, you know, we're going to say what we're going to do, and we're going to do it, and it's going to be what needs to be done in America's interest. Um, you know, do you like his style? No. But if you look at what he has accomplished, it is uh, very far-reaching, and, you know, he's a president who has, in fact, kept his word. Talk about, do you let's talk think about Israel. he could be viewed as a consequential president? Maybe already is. I think, in hi I think history will view him as a consequential president. That is really I mean, you look at both statement. Bush and Clinton said we would move the Israeli embassy to Jerusalem. Never happened. And it was just words. In this case, it's not just words with this guy. He, you know, he Can you dissect, because you worked uh, wor with Democrats on legislation, can you dissect the absolute hatred that is out there for him? Is it because of the style, do you believe, that they just don't like this person? I they think just can't stand them. I think it's really what's interesting about politics, and that is no one thing resolves elections. Basically, they come down to who do you trust. But in this case, I think there are a lot of people who can't stand his style. They say, well, I want my children to be able to look up to whoever's in the White House oh, wow. and I, admire that individual. I asked him this very question when he was campaigning. I said, some of the stuff, Mr. Trump, I can't really explain to my kids because right. it's pretty it's pretty rough and tumble some of the things you're saying about your opponents and he said yeah I know that I understand that and and he said it's it's part of what happens in a campaign but he took it to another level he understood that the Ameri that there was a significant group of American people who are uh, legitimate uh, believers in this country who were raised with faith in this country who were not being heard. And he reached out to them, and his style is in some ways very offensive. Uh, you know, I had people say to me during the campaign, yeah, his style is just New Yorker. Everybody in New York acts and does things like that. But, but so there are people that don't like his style. There are other people who are threatened by what he is actually doing. There are people who don't believe in uh, the kind of individual freedom, uh, the liberty, the notions of private property and free markets that he's fighting for, and so for them it's not style, it's that they want a different agenda. I heard on a few days back a woman was demonstrating, holiday that came along, and she was out there demonstrating in New York for socialism. Well, there are people who believe that's, that, that, that individual freedom, free markets, private property are bad, 
and he represents all those things. And they actually, they believe socialism is a better way to go. So it's some style and some substance, but the, but the depth of the hatred and the intensity of the hatred is unparalleled you've never seen in my life. I've never seen it. We're back with former Congressman John Shattuck on Newsmaker Sunday. Good to have him back in the program. Back in a moment. Back with former Arizona Congressman John Shattuck. He was swept into uh, the seat during the Republican Revolution in 1994. This was all a reaction to Bill Clinton's uh, election two years before that in 92. And Hillary Care. And you, and you res, res, uh, re, remain there until 20, let's see, no, 2011. 2011. In that time, how frustrated were you with Washington by the end? Uh, extremely frustrated. Matt Salmon was frustrated with it, too. A bunch of you guys came out of there who were part of the revolution, the quote-unquote revolution. I think really kind of... Uh, disappointed in what you'd seen? Well, we went back there with the belief that we could change something. And quite frankly, early on, we had a lot of success. Um, you know, we actually balanced the federal budget right. for a period of time. We got Bill Clinton to sign legislation requiring welfare recipients to work, a concept that's still a Donald little bit Trump's hot. kicking it around right now. Yeah. And, and you know, ultimately Obama repealed it, and now it's being discussed again. But it seems to me that humans are created to have to enjoy the dignity of work and productivity. So we did a lot of big things that were important in the early years, and then ultimately the town begins to get to you, and uh, you decide, well, if I keep causing problems for the establishment, then I'm not going to advance, mm -hmm. and what I want to do is advance. And so lots of people give up being revolutionaries and. Uh, instead of and worry reforming. about the next election. Yeah, that's right. Instead of reforming yeah. the place and making it better, they become part of the place. Let me ask you about. Uh, um, let's roll tape number two. You have any com any contact with John McCain? Um, I did during his reelection. I have not since he's become your ill. son helped run his reelection. He did. He he uh, he was the deputy campaign manager and was acknowledged by Senator McCain after the vote, after the election to have been a key player in his success. Let me ask you, this is an indelicate question, but I am hearing more and more on social media. There are people saying, should Senator McCain resign the seat if he cannot fulfill the duty? It's been seven months. It, given the pace in Washington, how little they get done, and how much he is injecting himself, even while in Sedona or in, at his home up in the mountains, uh, I don't think so. I think he earned this, and I think uh, I understand that he is on the phone with his staff every day, and you see statements issued where he either compliments somebody or disagrees with something. Uh, he he made he's made comments about. And you uh, believe those statements are coming from him? Oh yeah, I mean, no I'm sure they'll be. His staff will help get them done, like they always have. But I see no evidence that he is completely disengaged. In, in the final days of Senator Hayden's service in the Congress, people would say, you know, they'd wheel him in and out. Ted Kennedy. It, yeah, it happens to a lot of people. Who had the same I, I, exact. I, you know, were yeah. it to drag on for years, maybe, but uh, I've been told by people close to John McCain that his goal is not only to get back to Washington, but to walk back onto the Senate floor on his own power, not in a wheelchair. Now. You know, everybody says this is a disease where that doesn't happen, but right. if anybody can change the, the norm uh, and can overcome it or get to that point, it's probably John McCain. Your name has been mentioned along with many others. If Senator McCain were to vacate that seat? I, I have no comment on this topic. Uh, that hasn't happened, and it'll be dealt with when it happens. I haven't spoken to anybody about it. The family and I talk about it occasionally, but yeah. uh, I mean... Sure, the United States Senate is a great place to fight for freedom. And fighting for freedom is what I care the most about, kind of to preserve what the founders gave us, which is unique in all the world. But th everything else is just hypothetical. I'm, you know, I'm happy with my life. Let's roll tape number three. I just, as an Arizonan, and, you know, for a little history here, this guy has a, a, a deep history in Arizona. His father ran Barry Goldwater's campaigns, right? So, yes. what did you think of the Red for Ed movement and the teacher's situation? What, how did you read it, just as a, as a politico, but 
no longer actively, you know, uh, in the Congress. And it's not a congressional issue, it's an Arizona issue. But how did you read this? Well, uh, I spent my life in public education, I, you know, public grade school, public high school, public college, public law school. So, and, and my wife's a teacher, and both of my sisters were teachers. I didn't know your wife was a teacher. Yep. Okay. Um, so I, I do believe that we need to compensate teachers well, uh, but I do think that the, the ones that are exceptional, it comes from inside, but they should be rewarded. Mm -hmm. you, know, you get what you pay for in life. My only resentment of what happened in this circumstance, I guess, would be two things. One, the extent to which it was led or motivated, at least in significant part, by outsiders, not Arizonans, and it was really kind of a follow-on to a national movement. When I think Doug Ducey has been fighting to improve education from the day he got there. Now, has he improved it as much as some would like? No, but that's a money issue. If you, if you take a look at it across the country, the reason education is suffering everywhere across the country and the reason we're seeing these strikes is because we're spending so much money on health care. Uh, that is exactly I mean, right. It's outrageous. We're, nobody talks about nobody this. Nobody talks about it. Um, the expansion of Medicare and the expansion of government-provided health care, where we just promise and promise and promise, which indeed perhaps we need to do for those in need, but are we limiting it mm -hmm. just to those in need? Uh, and are we doing it the right way? You know, Did you think there's the, no, there's, did, there is no sense of competition or value for uh, benefit or, or value for service delivered in the medical area. Quickly, do you think that the walkout happened prematurely, that they should have given Governor Ducey the, op the, the chance to do the right thing? It seemed like he was trying to meet the demand that had been laid out. You can make the argument it not only happened too early, it lasted too long. I mean, it, it, in the end, they didn't get a lot for the last week and a half, two weeks of the, of the entire effort. Um, I, I mean, I think that in our country, you have to speak out for yourself, and they have the right to do that. I don't think they have the right to walk away from their jobs or their, or their public obligations. What do we do about these kids and finishing out their education? They say it was all about the kids, and yet uh, no one was there to teach them for all that time. We've got to take a quick break. John Shattuck, former congressman from Arizona, back in a minute to conclude Newsmaker Summit. Final moments with former Arizona Congressman John Shattuck talking politics of the day. Let's roll tape number six because I've got to ask you your thoughts having watched this North Korea situation. How hopeful are you that we might get something significant out of this? Or are you skeptical? Well, I think you have to be skeptical, skeptical but uh, I'm encouraged. Um, you, you don't know what you don't know. You, you know, we know what we think about Kim Jong-un, but... Uh, this is a part of the dialogue that has to occur, and so am I hopeful? I'm extremely hopeful. Do I think it's highly likely? No, but we really don't know until you try. Um, I, think they, that, I think that we're already closer to having some, something important happen or something meaningful happen than any prior president. Good to see you again. My pleasure. Come back. Yeah, anytime. John Shattuck, former congressman from Arizona. We'll see you next week on Newsmaker Sunday.